Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Cristina Fuentes. I'm international director of the Hay Festival. And I'm delighted to be with you all today presenting Orhus 39. Orhus 39 is a project that belongs to Europe European Capital of Culture, Orhus 2017. And it consists on the selection and celebration of 39 young adult and children's writers under the age of 40 across Europe. Basically, we put a long list together on three judges, Matt Hike from the United Kingdom, Ana Cristina Herreros from Spain, and Kim Fun Ackerson from Denmark chose these 39 very talented writers. And uh, we're going to celebrate them. We're going to celebrate them through an anthology. We commission short stories to each of them with the theme journeys. We're going to put up two volumes, one uh, between eight and 12 years old, aim, and the other one aimed for 13 plus. Alma Book is going to publish this in England, in English in May, and Gildendal in Danish. And basically, we, um, 38 illustrators, are going to illustrate these stories. They are the best illustrators in, the, in, in Europe. And we have worked with more than 40 translators, translating the, the, the pieces into English and into Danish. So it's a big, big homage as well to the, translator, to, to the translation, literary translation. So I'm going to very briefly show you the list. And um, yeah, let, let's go for it. So the selected list is Alain Aguirre from Spain, Andrea Antonio, Cyprus, Stefan Bachmann, Switzerland, Evor Benedictson, Iceland, he's here with us today, Kathy Clement, Luxembourg, B.R. Collins, United Kingdom, Sarah Crossan, Ireland, United Kingdom. Victor Dixon, France. Laura Dockrill, United Kingdom. Sarah Engel, Denmark. Andre Lund Eriksson, Norway. Ludovic Flamand, Belgium. Laura Gallego, Spain. Nina Elizabeth Grundvet, Norway. Finn Oli Heinrich, Germany. Annelise Hortier, France. Michaela Holzinger, Austria. Peter Frederick Jensen, Denmark. Sanne Mung Jensen, Denmark. Sandrine Kau, France. David Machado, Portugal. Ina Manakova, Russia. Annette Munch, Norway. Frida Nilsson, Sweden. Maria Parr, Norway. Anna Pessoa, Portugal. Dee Plumbeck, Denmark. Catherine Randall, United Kingdom. Gideon Samson, Netherlands. Natalia Elizabeth Savina, Germany, Latvia. Aline Sachs, Belgium. Sala Simuka, Finland. Jana Sramkova, Czech Republic. Elizabeth Stein Kellner, Austria. Cornelia Trav Travnisek, Austria. Maria Turshaninov, Finland. Stephanie de Velasco, Germany. Anna Volt, Netherlands. Catherine Woodfine, United Kingdom. And apart from the anthologies, we're going to celebrate these writers, inviting them to the first International Children's Festival, Hay Festival in Aarhus, that will take place at this amazing library, Dog One, between the 26th and 29th um, of October this year. So I'm very pleased, before we go to the, to the table, to introduce you to the CEO of Aarhus 2017, European Capital of Culture, Rebecca Matthews. Thanks, Christina. I'm delighted to be here at London Book Fair and here in the Literary Translation Centre. I come from Aarhus 2017. 
European capital of culture, but you can hear I'm not Danish, so nothing lost in translation. We are a year-long program of more than 450 cultural events and activities, which is taking place in Aarhus. That is Denmark's second largest city after Copenhagen. It's also taking place right across the central Denmark region in 19 municipalities. So in a country of around 5.6 million people, it's a small country, Denmark, our project essentially covers around 1.3 million. But of course, the European Capital of Culture is also a national project, it's a Danish project, and most importantly, it's a European European project. Our agenda is to look at culture in the broadest sense. So yes, we're, we're certainly looking at the arts and we're looking at literature, but we're also looking at food and sport and welfare, society, education, all of the things that make up our national identity as Danes. That's what we're sharing with Europe this year and vice versa. And we're doing that under our theme, which is let's rethink. And Rethink actually is, is much more than a theme. It is a, a mindset, a progressive mentality of thinking and acting smarter in the future than we do today, using a cultural platform to reflect, to debate, to exchange ideas about some of the big global issues that affect us all, democracy, sustainability, environment, but also issues that Denmark and local communities in Denmark identify as important for them. It's also a year of celebrations, of contemplations and of provocations, a year in which we ask what does Denmark bring to Europe? What does it mean to be Danish in Europe today? And it's a year driven by three core values, quintessentially Danish values, sustainability, diversity and democracy. And our events are epic in scale and also intimate, uh, ticketed and free. We have more than half of our events which are free entry. Uh, outdoor, indoor, static and mobile. From the highest end arts and culture to the community driven, the popular and the folkily, as we say in Denmark. It's all allowed and it's for everyone to find their place. Part of our program is, of course, importantly focused on literature, words, and language. And so, August 2017 is really, really proud to be working with the very best, and that is with Hay Festival. Uh, way back in 2014, I was having a lunch with Peter Florence, and we were discussing Hans Christian Andersen, as you do when you're talking about literature in Denmark, and Peter pitched the idea of an international children's literature festival in the country where arguably one of the greatest children's writers comes from. Uh, and that idea grew from then to where we are today, which is, of course, talking about the first International Children's Literature Festival uh, with Hay in Aarhus. And I'm thrilled because children and young people play such a major role in our European capital of culture, but also because as a European project, the heart of what we are about is working together across national borders. We have projects with more than 45 countries and a program that we hope clearly demonstrates and reflects upon the current and future diversity of Denmark and Europe as a whole and foregrounds the many cultures that live there. It's an open program and I think that we need that more than ever right now as we witness small fractures across Europe. So, in an age of some change and flux, age of uncertainty in some ways, how important our ability to communicate with each other, to use words and language and tell stories amongst ourselves, uh, especially to some of our youngest minds. Working across languages is of course critical in that endeavor to make sure we're hardwired to encounter, explore and sometimes explain that uncertain world. The purpose, the whole purpose of European Capitals of Culture is to celebrate and strengthen the diversity of culture and talent in our complex and now fast changing family of nations and regions. So more important now than ever is the ability of different communities to live and work side by side comes under the spotlight. As the brilliant Turkish writer Elif Shafak said last year at the European Culture Forum in Brussels, we may not break bread together, but we'll read the same book. In other words, culture, language, books can help us to focus on the things that we share so that we're less afraid of the things that we don't. So we're very excited to be part of this project with so many wonderful writers, so many languages, so many great stories to tell, and we're looking forward immensely to presenting that to all of the children in Denmark, stories from all over Europe at the International Children's Literature Hay Festival in Aarhus in October. We hope to see you there. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, Christina. It's, it's lovely to see you all here today. My name is Daniel Hahn, and uh, I am, among other things, the editor of the two collections of stories by our writers. Um, it's been an immense pleasure and privilege to work on these stories for, for the reasons that you will have gathered from hearing Christina and Rebecca talk, because we're talking about the work of some extraordinary writers, um, but also writers whose work in some way is very important because of the time we're in now, because we're also celebrating translation, because we're also celebrating the kind of stories that travel and why that's important. We're celebrating the work of some great European illustrators as well. The relevance of the story to the, of the stories in the collections to this moment we're in, and this thing that Rebecca also mentioned about these little fractures we're seeing, is particularly poignant, I think, when I tell you that we had our judging meeting to choose our 39 writers for this project um, on the 23rd of June last year. Some of you may remember the 23rd of June last year. There was, there was also another thing happening of somewhat less significance, I think, than our selection of choose these 39 writers, um, which was, of course, the Brexit vote. And while on the one hand, uh, it feels slightly odd to talk about those two things alongside each other because we kind of we, we often have this habit of talking about culture as a sort of isolated and relatively benign thing. It does now feel when we think about that day in which these momentous and dramatic and uh, I think concerning things were happening all over the country that there was a little room somewhere in wherever we were in Southwark or something um, in Bermondsey exactly. Um, doing this thing which now feels quite defiant, doing this thing which was a conversation about how do we talk about what is great about these things that are happening in Europe, these things that these writers are producing in Europe, and these things that we believe have value partly because they travel, because they speak to writers, uh, to readers, to other writers all over, all over the continent. So we're, it's lovely that we're celebrating this. I'm very pleased that we're having this particular celebration here in the Literary Translation Center. I know that many of you, I see lots of translators here who uh, are at home here. Um, because again, part of what this um, part of what this project is celebrating is not just translation as an art in itself, but it's also what it represents. Because translation and translation of literature of stories is sort of is by definition the anti, it's the most anti-protectionist thing, the most anti-cultural nationalist thing you can possibly imagine. So it's very much in the spirit of this place. So uh, I'm delighted that we're joined by uh, three of the contributors to these collections to this project. Uh, two of the uh, writers, Catherine Randall to my immediate right, and I with Benedictson uh, in the middle, and Guy Pusey at the far end, who is a translator who's translated the story uh, by Maria Pa, one of our Norwegian writers. Um, I want to talk quite generally in a moment about this sort of project and about what writers what the role of writers are as a kind of international figure, but I want to start by talking about these particular stories first. Um, and Okay, maybe I'll ask you if you would say, just describe briefly what, what your story is, the story that you wrote um, for this collection. So the story is uh, for sort of seven-ish age range, I write for nine to twelve-ish, about a little girl who discovers that she has a coat that means that she can fly when the wind blows and it leads her on a quest to discover some moss that her grandfather needs and it's a very fairy tale setting. It's a house set into the side of a mountain and the birds that she has to defeat can talk and they can see your deepest fears and they can convince you that they're true. Um, and the whole thing was supposed to be playing on a lot of the old school fairy tale themes that we've had since about sort of 1400, which are themselves very, very European. Does, does that, is that a significant part of what you're doing? Because you, when you say the, the, it's a very fairy tale kind of story and the setting and the, the mode in which it's told, is, is the fact that it's a European story, does that, does that mean anything to you? It, it did a lot. So the, I was writing it while I was in Sweden and the mountain is supposed to be a, a mountain in Sweden, but it could, I think, be anywhere in Europe. Um, and the birds are in part a joke. Uh, um, Marina Warner, who was writing that book about European fairy tales a few years ago, says uh, stories are the things that can migrate as freely as birds across boundaries. And I think we have this this body of, of fairy tales which feel as if they have been made up from all these various different places and, and it, I mean there are yeah like the, the coat is supposed to be playing on a sort of a Russian idea of a, a flying cape um, so yeah there, there's all lots of little bits of different different cultures put in there thank you I'm going at some point I'm going to ask each of them to read just half a page or so from their stories 
because one thing which those of you who've been to the London Book Fair before, which is most of you, will notice that we often forget to talk about things like you know, actual writing here um, because we have quite a lot of rights transactions to talk about and I think it's quite nice to hear a few lines of really good writing every once in a while. So I'm going to come back to Kate and ask you to read something in a moment, but, but Iwa, can you say the same sort of thing? Can you just give us a brief uh, kind of setup of what your story is, please? Uh, yeah, my story is, is called The Great Book Ex Escape and I wanted to write uh, an adventure story about a librarian and uh, because I love books and I love libra librarians and uh, I, I wanted to... We have to one non-translator in the room, an actual <laughs> librarian somewhere. And uh, yeah, and she, she shows up one morning and she, she has control over the children's section. She shows up one morning and all the books are gone. But the books leave a clue. You know where to find us, come and find us. And she has to really step out of her comfort zone to find them because up until now she has experienced these books only by reading them, but now she has to find them. And uh, I also I, I like the idea of of an action-packed story starring starring a librarian. I really like that. So. Yeah, it's it's like we didn't have enough of those already. Yeah. Here, here in the UK, they're all they're all like that. Yeah. It may, maybe it's different in Iceland, but here, yeah. all of us, right, all of our adventure kind of action heroes, they're all librarians here. Um, I have something which I'd like to ask you about those books, but again, I'm going to I'll come back to you and just ask Guy to say something. Guy, Guy would you? Maybe I can ask you just to, to introduce Maria's story, but also say a little bit about her work more more generally, because Guy's translated. Uh, two of Maria's novels, the second one of which is coming shortly. Um, so you, after Maria, you are the person who knows Maria's work best as the, as the translator. So can you say a little bit about her work for people who don't know her? Yes, of course. So um, yes, Maria Parr is from, she's from Norway. She was born in 1981. So she's, she's quite a, a young author, like all the authors, I think, that are going to, to Aarhus as part of this project. Um, and her, her first novel, I have it here, the Norwegian edition, Vafaljarte. Um, well, um, I think it's from 2005, and this is the story really of two friends. They are neighbours. They are the only children their age living in the the place where they live, which in Norwegian is called Knat Matilda, and uh, in English Matilda Wick Cove. Um, and yeah, there's the there's the the boy Trilla and uh, his friend Lena. Lena is very sort of. Um, headstrong character, always the one with the ideas. Trill is a bit nervous, he's never quite sure what to do. He's very sure that Lena is his best friend, but he doesn't know if he's Lena's best friend. So that's that story. And yes, this is already out in, in English um, from Walker Books, Waffle Hearts. Um, and the sec her second book, which is really her major breakthrough, um, Tonya Glimmerdal, it's called um, in Norwegian. In English, it's going to be called Astrid the Unstoppable. Okay, the, this is the, the name of the protagonist in Norwegian, Tonya, but she's called Astrid in English. Um, and this is the story of another very headstrong, um, uh, um, strong, independent female character with red hair from Scandinavia. Might remind you of somebody. Um, and I wonder where the name Astrid could have come from. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's her second book. Her third book has only just been written in, in Norwegian. Um, as we speak, they're working on the edit. And um, uh, I, can, uh, I can tell you hot off the press, I have the summary that I translated into English. And in the working English title, would be the goalie and the sea, and this is we're back to the to the main characters from Waffle Hearts, and uh, Lena is now a goalkeeper. Um, yes, and what will happen next is a few years down the line. Trilla, meanwhile, is uh, trying to work out how to impress the ladies. <laughs> Lovely, and the story in this. Uh in this collection, so the story that Maria wrote for yep. for the Aarhus project. Can you just tell us about that? So the story that Maria uh, worked for the, worked, wrote for this collection is called A Trip to Town, and this is um, really it's the story I think of Maria's own grandmother, who was called Marie, uh, a name very similar to hers, and. Uh, I think it's easy to, to forget that Norway, we know it as a, a very rich country these days, but um, not that long ago it was the poorest country in Western Europe. Um, and, um, and Maria's grandmother, she really wasn't able to travel very much. She could see a town from where she lived, but she'd never gone there. Um, and then one day, um, her school teacher asked her to write a, an essay about a trip to town. What was she going to do? Well, she had heard about town and she could imagine what it was like, so she just wrote a story. And it was such a great story that she got 10 out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> 
So one of the one of the things that all the stories in these collections have in common is they're all in some way about German journeys. This was the one brief that all of the the writers were given. In Maria's case, it's interesting because it's a journey that didn't happen except in her imagination. But I wonder, just thinking about the, that kind of constraint to give a writer, I wonder maybe Kate will ask you first what that experience is like of being told we'd like you to write a story, which is more or less this long, but there are, there is an expectation of what it's going to be about, so you're not just going to do any old thing you want. How does that feel for a writer like you to, to have that, that, that trigger sort of decided by someone else? It is, it is very different from the way that most people go about pitching a novel, because with that you have an idea and you live with it for quite a long time before you pitch it, and it's yours, and it feels very yours, and with this you are much more dropped into the middle of a swimming pool and told to find one of the sides, but um, um, it was it was wonderful to have that to have something that narrows down. I mean, everyone who's ever written it, probably the same with translation. When you sit down, you could go anywhere and anything, and that's quite frightening. So at least you had edges, and it was good to have edges. And um, and of course, a journey could be anything. Uh, mine is about a girl who flies up and round a hill. And Sarah Crossan, a colleague of mine, hers is about a child who hopes that the new baby coming into their family will die. So you know, they're not they're not necessarily of a piece. Um, and I loved that it was something that would be a push rather than a shove in a direction. Um, and, and I guess if you do something like film, I do a little bit of film and theatre, and that is much more um, someone tells you what to do and you try to do something that you both think is good. Um, so it was a little bit more akin to that, perhaps. Mm. Ayo, did you find that, th that there was some, as Kate said, that there were some benefits to having this, this sort of constraint? Or is it, or is it inhibiting somehow, no, being told I, I, what, what we want from you? I liked it. I like setting rules for myself when I write. Sometimes it's the length of the story or, or certain themes that I want to include in the story. But I, I liked having... Mm. I, I, yeah, sometimes a, a completely blank page can be terrifying. So this was a nice... Like a... Like a when, you go, when you go swimming when you're little and put... The, you know, <laughs> the arm bands. Yeah. Yeah. This was like that for me. I, mm. I, I liked it. Yeah, it helped me. One of the things that's, that's interesting for me in, about your story, Iwe, which relates to exactly what this project is about, you said that um, all of the books in the library suddenly disappear and the librarian has to go and find them and they are in places that are, each of them is somewhere appropriate, somewhere that, that if you could, you could work out where you would find these books. But what's very striking for me is that the books in this library are from everywhere. This is not a collection of Icelandic books that I have never heard of. As someone who is very entirely ignorant about writing the kind of the, the, the hinterland of writing for children in Iceland. So I was struck by the fact that your imagination of what a library looks like, a children's library looks like, is an incredibly rich international thing. A, a European but international thing in which the books that are the kind of emblems of this culture are just as likely to be Peter Pan as they are to be um, something from Iceland, something from France. And I wonder whether that tells us something about your reading as a child, whether it tells us something about the kind of books that are important to you as a child, or the kind of the, the breadth of what you find in, in children's reading in Iceland. Yeah, I mean, um, there are so few of us. We, we are 330,000, I think, all of us. But all of you are writers. Yeah, I know. It's a huge number. Writers or musicians. The high, highest per, per capita, I believe, the highest yeah, per capita. Yeah, there's something of in the water. In, they they in Iceland. spill ink in the water and we just. Yeah. No, it's. it's uh, no, we, 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 we read a lot of translated books and. Uh, and uh, so we get the uh, influences, influences mm. from all over, mm. and I think that's a great thing. Mm. I, I think, uh, and but we are also very uh, we write a lot. And Icelanders, they most of the books are published in October or November because we, for some reason, we almost only buy books for Christmas. But then we buy books, and we like there are like three hundred books published in one month, and every, and we call it the the Christmas book flood. And every year we get this wonderful flood of books. And, uh, and then you lock yourself away for three months. Yes. And, and reread read it until yeah, it gets yeah. light again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. It's a perfect plan. <laughs> it works. So, um, but yeah, no, no, this, this is, it, it's fun coming here, for example, and walking around and seeing characters and books that I recognize mm -hmm. from Icelandic mm -hmm. translations. And uh, we, we, 
pride ourselves in in translating uh, books and doing it really well, mm. and and that gives us back wonderful worlds that we wouldn't mm. visit otherwise. So yeah, Guy, were you as a as a reader? Were you formed in your childhood reading by? this sort of breadth of things we're talking about. Because we know that, and we can come on to this later, that we know that we don't translate nearly as much in this country as we should do. But certainly the kind of books that are formative for a lot of child readers in this country, a lot of them are, you mentioned, um, Astrid, yeah. um, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Guy, did you have that, that, that same experience of being formed by a kind of international... Yeah, yeah. And... and when 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 I was reading when I was little, also I have three other siblings, and we all read a lot. We didn't care if it was an Icelandic book or mm. from Sweden or from Japan or from anywhere. Mm. It just if the book, if the story, if the characters interested us, we read it. Right. And I think yeah, I think that's the that's the key when we were choosing books. And the other two, guy, what about you? Um, yeah, well, I don't know. I think my, my favourite author as a child was uh, Roald Dahl, who is, of course, Norwegian. Um, <laughs> and Welsh. <laughs> there's bound to be one here. You but, always assume there's going to be one. Yeah. Welsh-Norwegian, yes. But in fact, um, yeah, the Norwegians don't do a very good job of claiming this author for, for themselves. You know, this is one of the world's greatest children's authors. And, and yeah, he's okay, yes, he's Welsh and Norwegian. Um, but they, they never really claim him. Anyway, as for, as for translated literature, I think the, the book I remember reading and thinking, this, there's something strange going on here, um, was um, it was the stories of Babar actually, and the, there was uh, seemed to be very sort of French-looking architecture, you know. Mm. Um, people seemed to be eating croissants or something. There was a character who was sometimes called Madame and sometimes the old lady. What was going on there? <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, um, I think that's that's where I first noticed that I was reading right. something that might have might have been in a different language to start mm. with. Yeah. Kate, you said something about this, you know, this, this little touch of. A kind of Russian story, the fairy tales. Would you have been aware when you were reading these things? I assume that you were reading European fairy tales as a child. Were you aware in any way that they were from from elsewhere, other than that they're from elsewhere because they're from a fantasy world? I think I would have been to an extent, but that would have been because people would have told me. I went to international schools, and so of course there the people do mention um, that they try to flag up the difference of culture. I guess sometimes, um, and then you know. Uh, like we, we were given various versions of certain stories from quite a young age, like the very early French versions of Cinderella, where you know the wicked stepmother gets her head chopped off by the lid of a trunk, mm. um, and and then other things. We had uh, we had <laughs> we had a lot of stories that would come in two versions. Like we had asterisks in French and English, and of course that is one of the most glorious translating jobs in the world. Um, the English translation of the French asterisks is just spectacular. So we I think we were aware that that different languages were clustering in on our bookshelves. Mm. Yeah. But you didn't have, I mean, presumably, that's one of the things we have a, slight, a slightly odd attitude in this country because we translate very little for children particularly, even, it's a bigger problem even than for adults. And yet, I don't know if you've ever met a child who would have had a problem with that. Have you ever met a child who said, no, no, this one's a translation, I couldn't possibly. <laughs> it's a slightly perverse way of, I mean, maybe, maybe some of you were those children, but that seems, it seems like a slightly odd way of thinking about it. I can't think that could possibly... I'd like to talk about translation um, itself, translation as a thing, if you like. And I'm going to start with Guy as a translator, because one of the things that's, uh, one of the things that I was really pleased about with this, this the kind of process of casting the translators for these uh, stories was that there were some cases where we had a translator who knew the writer's work already. I didn't have to think for a second who was going to translate Maria's story, because I'd read Waffle Hearts, and I knew that he was sort of a, a perfect fit already. And I wonder if you could say something about... Um, I suppose about what it is to have that relationship with an author where you're asked to translate a piece of work and you kind of know what you're doing already. You kind of, I mean, is there a benefit to being sort of on the move already by the time you, you, you sit down and take on a new bit of Maria Power? Absolutely. It's, um, I don't know if it's like riding a bicycle or what it's like. But, uh, a bicycle that's already moving. <laughs> but, um, jumping on a moving bicycle. <laughs> but, um, well, I think I, I grew up in, in the Highlands of Scotland. It was a very similar environment to the environment that Maria um, Parr describes in these books as well. A very sort of isolated community where there weren't many children anyway. Um, and, and yeah, where there's this place called town that's far away. Um, and, um, and yeah, so I could really identify with that. And I think, it, yeah, I just, you know, it feels very much like, like my own child. Childhood. That to start with is that, mm -hmm. um, and yeah. Also, I think yeah, having got to know um, the 
the author's writing so in depth. Yeah, you, you do really get a feeling for it. Maria has a very particular use of language. She uses a lot of very creative languages. Uh, language she makes up her her own kind of um, um, pseudo swears or minced oaths, you might call them. Um, so things like um, in English, you might say perhaps um, sugar <laughs> mm. or fiddlesticks, and um, uh, and so she has expressions in in Waffle Hearts that um, I chose to to um, to adopt fishing terminology to translate. So um, what was you know, we had nothing to do with fishing, but it was just a rather well very unique idiomatic kind of uh, expression of annoyance became smoking haddocks or you smoked haddock, um, and in her second book it's uh, it's land animals that are used instead. So we have blinking badgers and um, what else um, pesky puffins things like this. Um, so um, so yeah that that sort of style of language you know I I, I so as I kind of developed. Uh, um, yeah, kind of lexicon to, to use for her, yeah. In, the, in this particular story, Trip into Town, were there particular problems, particular little kind of naughty bits well, that you had? I mean, there always are. It's, it's a safe question for a translator, but no one ever says, no, it's fine. Um, I should say, what were the particular problems? <laughs> well, let me have a look. It was only a few pages long, of course, but... Um, um, the, it's enough. It's always enough. There is, there is one word in here which is rather crucial to the text and that is very difficult to, um, to find an adequate translation for, and that is mood mood. Um, which is grandmother, but it's maternal grandmother. And you can't really describe that in English without it sounding very sort of specific, and, um, and it, it's not really in keeping with the register of the story at all. So it just did just become granny. Um, we don't did really it know. actually matter if it's a maternal grandmother or a paternal one? Well, I don't know. Maybe it did, but um, unfortunately... But that, Maria didn't that complain at any she point. She didn't complain, it. but um, uh, yeah, that's one example. I think another one was um, a very interesting one where, where I actually had to ask um, Maria, is this uh, the teacher that's mentioned in this story? Is he a male teacher or a female teacher? Uh, because it doesn't say in Norwegian, it's just the teacher. And we don't need to say in English, he or she either, but the teacher peered over the top of his glasses or her glasses. We really do need to say his hair. Or we could say the teacher's glasses again, but it sounds very odd. So um, so I said, is this a male or female? And she said, well, I'll need to ask my father, was it a, <laughs> was it a male or female teacher that my granny had? Uh, and it was a male teacher, so there we go. Um, but things like that, yeah. Sometimes we need, we need to get a bit more specific also about when uh, her grandmother's writing this story. Um, in Norwegian it says, Ho diktai veg so de knako song. Um, she wrote away and it was, yeah, making a lot of noise as she wrote, basically. Basically. And I made this, her pen screeched and scratched. But was it a pen or was it a pencil she was using? I needed to ask. <laughs> I assumed it was a pen, and indeed it was, and that's lucky because that's what the illustration shows as well. <laughs> yes. Well, one of the problems you often have as a translator is you ask the writer this question and they say, uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> because they've never had to think about it, because actually th these things are not constrained in their language the way they're constrained in yours. I, well, when you were translated for this book, you were translated by a, a very good American translator called uh, Meg Maitich. Um, did she, was she in touch with you? Did she have questions for you? Did she say, is this a pen or a pencil? Or did she secretly go off and do her thing and keep out of the way? Yes, yeah, she, she just, yes, yeah, secretly. She just surprised thing. you at the end. Yeah, 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 and, and it was it was almost yeah perfect. I think it was really nice, and and uh, we met afterwards and had a cup of coffee. and It was really nice, but yeah. Well, she she just moved to Iceland. In yeah, fact, and she knows the Icelandic she all of a sudden for some reason. So that's pretty good in a few months. And uh, no, she did a wonderful translation, and uh, and uh, yeah, it's it's there were some references we were trying to find the English translation for Hakkabakus uh, Goen. So that was a bit of a headache, but we, we had some, we, we, we managed. What does so it mean? It's a, it's a children's book. Uh, it's also a play, and, and, and it's a, hmm? by Torbjörn Egner. So I think it, be, a, yeah. it was Lily the Lemming and her forest friends yeah, that yeah, you yeah, came yeah. up with in the yeah, end. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we went some middle, middle ground there, but yeah. Can you say something? Because you're in an unusual position. We don't have this, a lot of English language writers don't have this. You're in an, an, in an unusual position that you can read your translation very comfortably, very closely, and very sensitively. Yes. And I wonder if you can say something about... It's quite a hard thing to describe, I guess, but what you feel your relationship is to this thing. this Because this story is your story, but it's also all of the words are someone else's words. Yeah, apart yeah, from yeah. the words, it's your story, but that's quite a big thing. Yeah. So if you can say maybe how, how it feels... I mean, this is, this is yours the, and not yours. Yeah, this is the first thing that's been translated that I, I've written. So it was like the first feeling was like, oh my God, this is amazing. 
And then I started re look, reading. Look at my English. I'm such a great English yeah, writer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, it was it was really nice. It was strange in a way, though, because, like you say, th these are your words, but at the same time, they're not. But I really liked the translation, so it had the same tempo and flow, and so I was I was really fine with it, mm. and uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. I'm assuming, Kate, that you've been translated into... You read French, is that right? Yeah. But you've presumably been translated into lots of languages that you also don't read, yeah. including you are now translated into Danish in this, in this particular collection. It, is there some kind of... Is there some kind of anxiety that there is somewhere in the world there is a book saying, this is Catherine Ronald's <laughs> book, no idea what it says. <laughs> 220 pages of Latvian, I'm sure it's very good. But, but you know, this is your, you know, a thing which you took care over and made decisions about and were very precise about. And you choose your words, in, in, you know, not casually at all. And yet there is this thing which is, uh, of which you kind of have no control. I guess you reckon, I mean, that because language is so much part of a culture that if they're making decisions that make it even quite radically different, they will understand why that needs to be the case for their world that they're writing for. Um, so I'm relatively comfortable. The French one was quite a free translation and there were bits that I read and thought, no, that is better. Um, um, it, it's, it's annoying when someone has made your book better. Even the title is better in French. But, um, oh, what's it called? What's it called? Uh, <laughs> le ciel nous appartient. Sky belongs to us. Yeah, it is yeah, better. Yeah, that'll do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but then there are other moments where you will get a book and you won't... I mean, I received a book in the post and I looked at it for quite a long time thinking, not, not got a good clue. I mean, it was Indonesian. I had to Google it to work it out. Could you tell um, which book it was? I mean, I could tell it was Rooftop because it had the same title, but uh, the same picture on the front, right. but otherwise... Um, so, and with that, I guess you just, you quash the tiny anxiety in your heart that it might be completely different and mm. just think, if it is, I'll trust them. I'm sure you're right to trust them. <laughs> I'm sure there's nothing to worry about. I shouldn't have mentioned it. I'm sure it's all fine. I'm sure you're, I'm sure you're doing even better everywhere else. I want to talk a little bit about, about that process of, of, of books kind of moving around and finding new readers and new places. Because again, one of the things that, that is an assumption behind this project and is an assumption behind what everyone in this room does if you're part of the translators, uh, you know, gang, clan, tribe, whatever we are, um, is an assumption that there is a reason why something that Kate has written, something that Iwe has written, should be able to speak to all of these people in these different places. Um, and I wonder if you feel, or whether this is just somehow too grand, that particularly at a time like this for political reasons, you have as writers and as storytellers a particular role as people who can kind of cross borders in that way, people who have a kind of international I don't know who I'm going to ask first. Both, there's a slightly quizzical look from both of them. One of you. One of you. Go on. The idea that, that you have a particular kind of uh, authority or a particular kind of power or a particular kind of opportunity as a writer at a time when lots of cultures are kind of closing themselves in. That it's, that it's potentially very significant that you can be telling a story here and it's being read by people there, by people who have a very different sense of the world, a very different way of looking at the world. Yeah, yes. I, I'm still I'm still thinking of a of a good answer. Um, yeah, I mean, of, of of course, because we we in in the what's the English version of this? Uh, in the we say in Icelandic we say in the foundation the foundation of everybody is so similar. It's the same, and I I was uh, watching some video some weeks ago when they were talking to the. The people that the, the man that wrote um, Monsters Incorporated, and he had this idea. He wanted to write about monsters. They're doing something, and and everybody at Pixar was asking like, but what's the story? Where's the heart? What 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 are we doing here? And then in the meantime, he he had a, a baby, and he realized this is a story about becoming a father, and everybody can relate uh, mm -hmm. can relate to this feeling, except uh, uh, instead of some monster or something here we have the core and if we if we do this if we work from the core and and find you know find the the thing that moves us it will move other people and we can i mean it, this is this is yeah we, this is great power that we have because the readers are so young and we can have an influence 
and if we have something to say, we should say it. I think it was a very complicated way to a point, but I think I got there. No, it's yeah. <laughs> it was significantly better than the question. I have oh, sorry, I just, I'm going to um, have some coffee. I do want, uh, I, before we um, invite you to ask questions, I do want to ask each of you to read a little bit from uh, just the opening of your stories. Um, Guy, let me ask you to, to read the opening of, of your translation of, of Maria's story. Just, I don't know, half a page or so. Okay. <clears throat> a trip to town. I'm going to tell you a story about a journey. Well, actually, I suppose it's more of a story about a non-journey, but that hardly matters because it was Marie, my granny, who told it to me, and she was such a good storyteller. Now that I think about it, it's a bit of a shame you, that you can't hear my granny tell you the story too. But you can try to pretend you're sitting on a kitchen chair and are about nine years old, can't you? Then you can imagine a granny sitting on the other side of the table. My granny and I had almost the same name, Marie and Maria, and each of us was as much of a chatterbox as the other, even though neither of us experienced very much by way of excitement. I went to school and my granny stayed at home, but we still had so much to tell each other whenever we met that smoke would almost be coming out of our ears. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> it was Monday at approximately 8.47 a.m. when Sigrun, the librarian, turned on the lights in the children's section only to discover that all of the bookshelves were completely empty. The shelves startled Sigrun because they had been tightly packed with children's books of all shapes and sizes only the day before, but now they looked like the old friends who'd suddenly lost all of their teeth. <laughs> Sigrun's first reaction was to drop her Moomin mug. It was her favorite coffee cup, so letting it fall through the air was a very serious matter. The mug crashed when it hit the floor and broke into pieces, causing her coffee to splash all over the gray carpet and on her slippers. Her next move was to open her mouth and close it again four and a half times, as if she were a fish on dry land. The reasons behind this spasm were simple. Seirun had too many questions circulating around her head at almost the exact same second, like an avalanche of thought. And here are a few of them. Where are all the books? Am I dreaming? My coffee cup broke, there's coffee on the floor, and did I remember to turn off the stove? <laughs> Observant readers will notice that the last question doesn't really fit in with the rest, but we all know that it always comes up, no matter what we're doing. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I should say that um, there's, a, there's a line, you heard the Moomin mug being dropped on the floor. There's a line in the story about uh, Moomin mugs in which iOS says something like, but of course nobody owns, nobody anywhere owns just one Moomin mug. <laughs> and I wrote to him and I'd read the story rather sheepishly saying, I, I, actually I, I, <laughs> I own one Moomin mug. Um, and when he came to London today, he brought me one. So I'm pleased to see. <laughs> you see, you love him now, don't you? So, so I now have two Moomin mugs, I'm very, I'm very proud to say. One thing, Kate, before, before I ask you to read just the, the, first, the first kind of chunk of this, what well, strikes me when we have these, these kind of moments of just listening to the stories, I, I wonder whether for a writer one of the things that you get from these kinds of projects is not just you kind of get new readers and you're published in new places, but you're also part of a community of writers, many of whom you won't know, and you're hearing voices um, of, of writers whose work you will discover now, and I wonder whether that's important for you as a writer. Oh, hugely so. Suddenly to yeah. be alongside people who you... Who you no will be brilliant and then turn out to be um, is 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 such a pleasure and and like you say you know um, you know yeah to be grouped together with a group of people who are from Europe who are you know it, it it's a tiny tiny way of saying you know there will be no white flag you know we're not giving up um, we are European forever. Thank you. <laughs> Let's hear the beginning of your story. Um, so it's called Beware Low Flying Girls. Odile could fly only when the wind blew. It was cold that day she first took flight, and the snow lay thick enough to hide a cat in. She wore her father's coat. It came down past her knees, and she had rolled the sleeves up, so they hung at her wrist in great roll of wool. The coat had once been a deep cocoa bean brown, but now it was the color of an elderly shoe, and smelt very slightly of horses and wood smoke. The wind was fierce that day. It was often windy in winter at the top of the mountain. Birds got blown backwards up the cliff edge, reverse somersaulting through the sky, the winds shedding feathers like confetti. 
Seagulls blew into the house, sometimes right into her lap as she sat curled in a corner, wrapped in rugs, reading by the firelight. Suddenly finding that you had an irate seagull as a bookmark was not ideal, thought, ideal, but her grandfather would throw a blanket over them and stomp out into the night with the bird bundled up in his arms. Always be polite to birds, he would say, more than they let on. Thank you all very much. Well, I hope, apart from anything else, that's given you a taste of what's in the books, which are going to be out in uh, the, th the fourth week of May. Um, so, and they look like that, and they're lovely, and they're full of great things, which you've just had a taster of. We have a bit of time for you to ask questions of our writers and translator. So, uh, give us a wave. And there are mics and things. Yes, Annie. Hello. We just take the mic. So when the authors were being chosen, were they chosen purely on merit of these are great stories and great authors, or did you have in mind this European cohesion idea and looking for certain morals in the stories or something? Uh, no, no morals. No, no. <laughs> morals is the wrong word, but you know what I mean. Um, no, though, though I should say that we, the, the stories that are in the books uh, were commissioned for the books. So the writers were chosen, and once the writers had been chosen, they were then asked to write the stories. So they weren't chosen on the basis of a single piece of writing. Um, and they weren't chosen on the basis of anything other than we read uh, pieces of their work, the three judges read pieces of their work, and a little bit about them, a sense of kind of, try to get a sense of what they were like, uh, and chose the ones they thought were best. Um, and we assumed that if we chose the 39 who we thought were the best, or as far as we could tell the best, inevitably that we would end up with a group that was diverse, we would end up with a group that were writing about very different ages and stylistically interested in very different things. Um, most of the writers hadn't been published, apart from the ones who write in English, most of them hadn't been published in English uh, in any substantial way. Maria Parr is one unusual example. Maria Tuchaninov, who Annie translates, is, is another example. Um, but the decision were made based on pieces of writing that we were able to get, and we commissioned a lot of samples to be able to read their work. But we weren't, uh, we weren't looking at these, these stories because they didn't exist, and we weren't looking for uh, writers that... We weren't looking for writers that... Um, you know, epitomise the European ideal. We were looking for writers who are European writers, and and they add up to what this culture is. Um, I don't think there was any need to try and uh, engineer the, the symbolism any more than that. You you put these 39 amazing writers, and you look at what they can do, and say this well, this is what it adds up to. Yes, second round. Right Hello, uh, my name is Sika. I'm Icelandic, a translator, publisher, and actually work in a library, so now I need a Moomin mug. Um, I was just wondering, are there any plans in place as yet to translate these collections into other languages? Because I really want them to be in Icelandic. Um, I think it's a possibility. I think at some point, um, depending on whether particular publishers are interested, there's certainly no reason we couldn't do that. We're starting, of course, with the Danish publisher and the UK publisher, because it makes sense, because this is a partnership which is kind of born out of these two countries, with launches at the Hay Festival here, and then, of course, at Aarhus with the, pro uh, the, the program throughout the year, and then the festival in October. But I think the more countries we can get, um, more countries, more languages we can get this into, the, the better. We've had a couple of uh, publishers from two different countries have already approached the uh, Hay Festival and asked whether the rights are available, whether there's a possibility. Um, we then go back to the writers and see whether they're happy to do all this. Um, so I think it's, it's something which everyone would be excited about, but it's uh, next week, you know, one, one at a time. But we're, we're starting with two. But I think, I think the, the assumption, again, the, the assumption underpinning um, how we feel about the quality of, these writing, of, of, of this writing um, is that this should be as widely read as possible and that it has a place in other cultures and other languages and that's sort of what defines it, I think. Next question. We can wait very patiently. <laughs> I might have missed this, but why 39? Christina can answer that question. <laughs> Why 39? 
So the Hay Festival had had some had some previous with this one. I mean, oops. I mean, it's part of a project we have done in, in different contexts. It started in Bogota, when Bogota was um, UNESCO World Book Capital. And basically, we selected 39 writers under the age of 40 from the wider Latin America. And it was called Bogota 39. 39 under, under 40 years old. And then we did the same in uh, Beirut, when Beirut was UNESCO World Capital of the Book in 2010. Then we did the same in Port Harcourt in Africa, when it was UNESCO World Capital of the Book. But it has always been um, 39 under 40. To be honest, the, the, it was going to be called Bogota 40, 40 under 40. But basically there was a very famous paramilitar in Colombia called Jorge 40, George 40. <laughs> And the mayor forbade us to use Bogota 14 because of all the connotations. So then we decided, okay, Bogota 39. So, you know, that's the real reason. You know, so you ask. I've never heard that story. That's amazing. You never asked you that. <laughs> I assumed you had some weird reason. Turns out you do, in fact, have some weird reason. Sure enough, you know these hay people. Uh, one last question. Anyone? No, is that it? Right, well, thank you all very much for coming. Please join me in thanking our, our speakers, Guy and I, and Catherine, and uh, look forward to bringing you